The lights are in my face, I know that. Can I tar start talking? Oh, I can see right here. Hey folks, episode 17, Elk Talk Live, brought to you by Botech, Leupold, Onyx, Black Gold, Tight Spot, Ripcord, all kinds of great companies making this possible. Uh, I just got back from a long trip. Uh, went on my first morning of elk hunting here in Montana this morning. And you cannot believe how many bugles I heard. Zero. Not even any blood on my grouse arrow. I mean, to go hunting and, and go through all that, get up at four in the morning, drive that far, and not even shoot a grouse? Man, I'm not, I'm not qualified to be the host of this. If you can't even shoot a grouse, Randy, you might want to give it up. But anyhow... Thanks everybody for following along and watching. We are in the absolute heat of it. Right now, I talk about the five seasons of elk hunting or the five calendar periods. We're already past the early season. We're past the pre-rut. We are now in peak rut. And peak rut is gonna last for about, oh, probably another two to three weeks, depending on your latitude and how the elk behave in your area. So, I'm going out again tomorrow. All of you heard about Montana's on fire, everything's going bad. We are supposed to get anywhere from eight to 10 inches of snow in our high country starting tomorrow. I like that. So hopefully it'll snuff out all the fires and it will create some really, really good elk hunting. A little disclaimer here. We look like we have a really bad storm coming our way. So. If you see us kind of slide back and roll down the garage door and you hear some noise, it's because we're trying to get the camera gear out of the weather. So with that, oh, got a question that had it a couple times last week and right away a couple popped up this week. And you'll, uh, you'll see, some of you will know what this is. It's called the Mophie. Uh, this one was given to me by the good folks you can see at OnX here. And the question is, how do I keep my phone, my, my uh, smartphone charged when I'm in the offline or slash airplane mode and I'm using the app on here as my GPS? For me, it'll last, depending on temperature, it seems like if, depend, and again, how much I'm running it, how many layers, all kinds of other stuff, what I have my backlighting set at, it's lasting about eight to 10 hours. And then once that happens, if it starts dying, you take this little jobby, and I can get about two to three chargers out of this little Mophie to recharge my phone. They make them bigger than that. Uh, this one's really light. I bet you that doesn't weigh four or five ounces. So between these two, I'm good for quite a while. And this Mophie will recharge on a solar charger without much problem. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, Michael, what do you, you got anything that yeah. hit the press right away? Uh, this is the general one. Should I use a call or a cow call in late October? Uh, probably not if you're hunting bulls. Uh, and the reason I say that late October is the post rut season, almost the late season. Calling is going to be very ineffective at that time for public land, mature bull elk. So I probably wouldn't even bother. There's a good chance you might call in some hunters. If you want to have one with you, maybe you've got some elk that are moving off. If you do give a cow call, sometimes it'll stop them just for a second. So that would be the reason to use it. Boy, um, these, uh, these lights are bright tonight. You guys trying to blind me so I can't see an elk tomorrow? I'm already half deaf or mostly deaf. Now you're trying to blind me. I got all kinds of excuses about why I might miss an elk in the morning. I got one. All right, Marcus has one. Uh, what's the best way to gauge an elevation that bull elk will be at? Temperature based or just situational? What's the best way to gauge what elevation elk will be at? Temperature or situational? Uh, I've never really thought about that, so I'm going to make this up. Uh, for me, it's situational. Uh, they, they will move based on the situational weather. Uh, they will move based on the situation of drought or, or moisture that, that, that kind of determines how high up or how low down uh, in elevation the best feed is because if the best feed is there, that's where the cows are going to be. 
and they're going to be near the cows this time of year. So I'm going to go with situational on that. I don't think you can consistently say, oh, I'm going to hunt this band right here. At least not in my experience. Michael. Uh, what form of communication would you recommend for emergencies while out in the mountains? I just, okay, I got to re restate the question. What form of communication would you suggest for emergencies while out in the mountains? Uh, in the past, we've used cell f or, uh, satellite phones some. If we have coverage, we'll use cell phones. Tomorrow, I saw that my uh, Garmin inReach is going to be here tomorrow. And when we are heading to Wyoming next week, I was telling the camera guys, well, you know, I've had four blood clots in the last eight years. I've had this, I've had that. And they're like, really? What, what, what's our communication device? I'm like, well, just bury me and tell my wife what the GPS coordinates are. That didn't seem like a real comforting solution to them, so I ordered an inReach. And uh, that's what we're going to be using. I've never used it before. I've read a lot of reviews. I've talked to a lot of guys out on our Hunt Talk uh, web forum who use it, and they have great things to say about it. So that's what I'm going with this year. Do you ever use pack animals? Do I ever use pack animals? No, until next week in Wyoming. Bo Beatty, uh, a guy we know from uh, Idaho Falls, Idaho, he is going to join us. And he's bringing six llamas. I think I met Bo a year and a half ago, and we've communicated a lot. And he keeps telling me, Randy, with all your production gear and everything else, you should rent llamas from me, or you should bring some of my llamas. All right. So we're going to be hunting not too far from him. And he's bringing over some llamas, and we're going to find out how it works. So other than that, horses, no. I've never hunted with horses. I didn't grow up in a horse family. If I had a horse, he'd probably die of neglect because I know nothing about taking care of them. I view horses as automobiles without steering mechanisms or throttle controls. Most people I know who hunt in the mountains with horses for years and years are on a first name basis with an orthopedic surgeon. So for all those reasons, I've never used stock animals in my elk hunting. That's, as I'm getting older, I'm starting to rethink that logic and I'm hoping that maybe Bo's uh, uh, llamas will be a solution to that. I wonder if they can hear these geese flying over my They're house. Well, I've got like a major migration of geese going over my house right now. So I'm sorry if, if we're making too much noise there. So uh, what else we got? Tell us about your mittens and where I can get a pair. My mittens. So a lot of you see in my cold weather hunts, I wear I'm, I'm not a glove guy. I, for me, if you want to wear gloves, then you want to wear or want to have cold hands. I wear mittens. The mittens that I use are called chopper mitts. Those of you who grew up in the, nor in the northern plains, the upper Midwest, you know what they are. They're a leather mitten that has a rag wool liner that pops out. You can replace it. You can bring extra liners with you. You can put one of those uh, hand warmer packs in there and you will have warm hands no matter how cold it is. And when things happen in a hurry, you can shake that glove off and have a nice warm hand to go boom or thump. Rather than trying to get those really cold gloves off and your fingers are so cold, you can't even fire your release or pull your trigger. So where you can get them is L.L. Bean, uh, Fox River in Wisconsin. Uh, Cabela's used to have them. I, just go Google chopper mittens and a whole list of them will come up. Don't leave home without them. All right, so there's still smoke and fire issues in Oregon. Uh, what big effects do you think that smoke, extreme dryness, and fires have on elk? Still smoke and fires in Oregon. What do I think the effect is on elk with smoke, fires, and extreme dryness? Uh, not that much other than in the absolute local area where the fire is, obviously it's going to displace the elk, but the elk still have to live their lives. Elk evolved on this landscape, and this landscape is a very fire-prone landscape. Even though we've been suppressing fires for years and well, decades now, elk don't really make a big change to their behaviors because of fire. Now, because of really hot and dry weather, maybe they got to move somewhere else for better feed. Maybe they got to move somewhere else for water. But the fire and the smoke, they just deal with it. Uh, 
how do you judge scat? And he says, does the elk poo need to be steaming for you to get excited about finding it? <laughs> how do I judge scat? Does the does it need to be steaming for me to be excited about finding it? Uh, no, not really. And quite honestly, I, I don't pay that much attention to it unless it is like still wet. Then I know there is an elk right there. The places I hunt, there's scat just about everywhere. Every trail, every little meadow. If you get looking closely, there's going to be elk scat in a lot of places. I don't get that worked up about it. I look at, yeah, okay, they've been here. If I'm walking down the trail and it looks like, okay, this is an hour old, yeah, then I get excited. All right, so how do you take the brains out of a skull for transportation? How do I take the brains out of a skull for transportation? There's two ways. You either crown it, uh, cap it, whatever you want to call it. You take your saw and you cut it right here above the eye line and then you just have the rack on a skull cap. Or, and if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll see where we've done this before out in the field. You bring the stuff to boil the skull while you're, before you head home because a lot of states have regulations that you cannot bring any animal from another state, especially uh, brain tissue or spinal, any type of spinal tissue. So if you don't want to do any of that, your other option is to leave it with a taxidermist in the state where you shot it and have that person do a European mount. A lot of people don't want to mess with that, so they just do a skull cap and go with that. The whole idea or the whole concern about that is chronic wasting disease. Chronic wasting disease is a really big issue, and states are trying to stop the, I guess you'd call it translocation or whatever term it would be, the spread of it by uh, infected animals coming in from other states. Do you prefer a slower, heavier arrow for elk over a slimmer, faster arrow? Does that change for different game animals? Do I use a slower, heavier arrow or a slimmer, faster arrow? I'm always using 125 grain broadhead. Uh, this total arrow here is about 460, I think, if you weigh everything. Uh, a lot of people say that's a pretty heavy setup. I don't know if it's super heavy, but I would rather go with more mass, even if it creates a little bit less uh, speed and a little bit uh, more trajectory as you get out there further. I'm not one of those long bomber guys who's going to be shooting 60, 70 yards. And I use the same arrow setup for every animal, from grouse up to elk. I live at sea level, don't have any limited entry tags, and have $2,000 to spend. What state and hunt is my best bet to simply put elk meat in the freezer? Okay, someone lives at sea level, has a $2,000 budget, doesn't have any limited entry tags, wants to know where they can go on an over-the-counter general tag hunt and the best bet of putting meat in the freezer. It depends on if you're an archery hunter or a rifle hunter. I'm going to say you're probably a rifle hunter. Uh, boy, those geese are really... Man, I should... Oh, it's too dark. Season isn't open. I can't shoot them. Uh, <laughs> but they're distracting. Uh, I'm assuming that you're a rifle hunter because if you're an archery hunter, you'd already be out hunting them most likely. So if you're a rifle hunter, I would say go to Colorado. And if putting meat in the freezer is your goal, buy one of the leftover cow tags. There's still a lot of leftover cow tags in Colorado, and you should be able to fill that without too much work. Yeah, it, there's always the, the things that can go wrong. But as far as your best odds of putting meat in the freezer, if you live at sea level, go to Colorado, hunt the second or third season where some of these leftover cow tags exist, and go put some meat in the freezer. I intend to put some elk meat in the freezer next week because in Wyoming, my tag and Marcus, the guy right there behind the camera, we both have the same tag. It's an any elk tag. And I've told him the responsibility for shooting antlers is on him. For me, I'm shooting the first legal elk. I don't care if it's Boone and Crockett or if it's a year and a half old cow. That's how I'm doing it because I want elk meat in the freezer. I don't have any elk meat in my freezer right now. This is, this is grounds for serious problem. I'm going to solve that next week in Wyoming. What's your strategy on hunting clear cuts and burns? 
My strategy for hunting clear cuts and burns, if you go out to our YouTube channel, you'll see where I talk a lot about burns, whether it's e-scouting, whether it's hunting. Uh, I hunt them a lot. I hunt burns more than clear cuts because clear cuts usually have road issues. And you've heard me say time and time again that roads and elk usually are like oil and water. Elk want to get away from roads. Clear cuts, to create a clear cut, you usually have a, some sort of road there. Even if the road's been obliterated, it still results in a lot of traffic. So I'm going to hunt burns before I'd hunt a clear cut. But if all I have are clear cuts to open up the canopy, canopy and provide food, I'm going to hunt them. I am going to those kind of places hunting elk. That's where the food is. That's where the cows are going to be, especially in the peak rut right now. How often do you replace diaphragm calls? How often do I replace diaphragm calls? I think I need to replace the one I was using this morning. Uh, <laughs> I've been practicing with the same call all summer, and you'll notice on the diaphragm call, the reed can start getting a little stretched, and it doesn't quite have some of the tones uh, that you want. So I just let the call tell me, oh, man, that's not doing what I want it to do, or I'm having a harder time doing it, and I replace it. I use the... You, you know, the, the Rocky Mountain hunting calls make this bugle. They make the diaphragm calls that fit me really well. And when I say fit me, everybody, the roof of everybody's mouth is not the same. Some people have a really high roof to their mouth, and so a little diaphragm call will seal that off really easy. Some people have a very flat roof to their mouth, and trying to get the air seal on the roof of their mouth can be more of a challenge. Rocky Mountain hunting calls has a call that will fit any any mouth and so that's why i use their stuff it's they don't go with the one size fits all they make great calls there's a reason why they've their calls have won so many world championships how long should a calling sequence last and how many sequences until you move how long should a calling sequence last and how many sequences until you move it depends uh Sometimes it's just 30 seconds or a minute and don't hear anything and I'm walking the ridge. And we were talking about that this morning, about how much we call. We kind of let the elk tell us. But let's say there's a ridge that runs this way. I'll start here and I'll call off this side. I'll walk a few hundred yards. I'll call off that side. I'll walk a little further, call off this side. I keep doing that until I get a response. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, you're calling too much. Maybe I am, but I'm looking for elk that want to play. And this time of year, the best way to figure that out is to call and get a response from them. All right, so around what temperature or time of year do you think it's not worth sitting over a wallow? At what temperature or what time of year do I think it's not worth sitting over a wallow? That will depend on whether you're hunting in British Columbia or hunting in Arizona. Uh, it's hard to really tell. It's when they quit using them. And as long as they're still rutting and the temperature's pretty hot, the odds are they're going to keep using them. And that's a really good place to sit in the middle of the day when the elk are bedded. Maybe they're going to come in to water or to cool off or whatever. So it's really hard to say, oh, this date. It really depends on altitude, latitude, and the temperature of, of where you're hunting. Uh... Another call question. How do you call solo hunting? How do you call solo hunting? I think we covered that last week, but I'm going to talk about it again because it pops up all the time. So let's assume, I'm going to grab my grouse arrow here. <clears throat> the wind is blowing the direction my arrow is pointing. You are here, the elk is out there. You call, that elk knows his safest bet is to circle to the downwind side of where he last heard that call. So if you call from here and the wind is going this direction and he's out there, he's gonna loop down here. So if you can, call, but before you call, have a place lined up kind of at some quartering angle downwind further that you're gonna move to to get set up in the time it takes that bull to circle around. So you call here, you move over there, and if you move over here and the bull comes in to try to get your wind, now you've got your shot. Obviously, way easier said than done. Doesn't always work that way, but 
that's how it, how you can most effectively do it when you're hunting solo. Do you make jerky out of your elk? Do I make jerky out of my elk? Uh, right there's a smoker that I'm giving to the camera guy. Uh, I do at times, but I've grown way more fond of these the, these meat sticks like teriyaki sticks, pepper sticks, stuff like that. And I'm lucky there's a really good place where I live here in Montana outside of Bozeman called the Yellowstone Game Processing that makes the best teriyaki sticks out of any meat of anyone I know. So I'll get burger out of some of my elk trim, but a lot of it I'll get made into those uh, teriyaki sticks. What if there are no burn, burns or clear cut in your unit, what would you focus on <clears throat> post rut? Post red hunt, there's no burns and no clear cuts. What would I focus on? I would focus on anything else that creates a disruption to the landscape. But understand that in post rut, the elk are in sanctuary mode. Well, I'm going to probably be, be probably be hunting higher. I'm going to be looking for rock outcroppings. I'm going to be looking for changes in topography, uh, changes in in the steepness of the slope. Places that break up that canopy. Everyone seems to think that a healthy forest is this big, vast, green, evergreen ocean. That's a very unhealthy forest. That is not what elk look for. Elk look for places where the canopy is broken so that sunlight can get through, creates food on the, on the floor of the forest. So I'm going to go look for other places. And even if there aren't burns, even if there aren't uh, clear cuts, I'm going to those places where it, I, I can't remember ever hunting an area where there's not some sort of either a canyon or mountains or cliffs or rocks or whatever that cause the canopy to be disrupted. And that's where bulls will go somewhere near there because they can quickly come out of there, get a bite to eat right at that last hour, be back in there in the morning and hide and, and well, hide from hunters is what they're doing. All right. What do you young satellite bulls do during the post rut? Do they still actively seek the last estrus cows? What do young satellite bulls do during the post rut? So the post rut is about October 12th or 15th to the end of October. Those satellite bulls, some of them will stay with the cows, especially the and I wouldn't necessarily call a two and a half year old bull a satellite. He's a raghorn. Some of the three and a half year olds are going to stay with the cows. You start getting four and a half, five and a half year olds, they can still be satellite bulls depending on what your age class is. Those bulls are heading for sanctuaries. They're, they're getting away from the hunting pressure. As a general rule, they're going to go solo and hang out somewhere until they get into their late season pattern which starts sometime in early November. Once they're in the late season pattern, they're going to be in bachelor groups rather than solo. Do elk move all day during the rut? Bull elk, sorry. Do bull elk move all day during the rut? Yep. And that's not my experience. Some days they do, especially if the temperature is right and if the cows are up and moving. But if it's really hot, last year, Corey Jacobson and I were in New Mexico and it was in the mid to high 80s every day. The cows just went and bedded down for the day. They wanted to conserve energy. They wanted to stay out of that heat. They went and found some shade and stayed there during most of the daylight hours. So the elk weren't up moving around. I've had other hunts where they are up moving around all day long in the rut. You start getting into post rut and late season. No, they're not up moving around all day long at all. They're moving that half hour in the morning and that half hour in the evening. On a rifle hunt, how many miles will you walk from camp on a typical day to find elk? On a rifle hunt, how many miles will I walk from camp to find elk? Uh, well, so if camp is here, I might only go a couple miles and I'll bump into elk. I usually try to have some spot in mind that's two to three miles. But by the time I'm done uh, for the whole day, we're usually putting on 10 to 12 mile days in those late rifle hunts. It's just a lot of times you just got to keep moving, get into a different glassing spot. Move over here, get to a different glassing spot. Go over here, check this out, check that out. And by the time you do that loop and get back to camp that night, a lot of times those are 10 to 12 mile days. 
Will elk be out in a heavy snowstorm or will they hide in the timber? Will elk be out in a heavy snowstorm or will they hide in the timber? I've seen both. Uh, I've seen them bed down, I've seen them up feeding, especially if that heavy snowstorm precedes uh, a cold, what they sense is some really cold weather, they will be up feeding heavily even in that snowstorm. Uh, but I don't think there's any absolute rule to it that, oh, this is what they always do. I've seen them do both. Um, there, how, people want to know what yardage you set your bow pins at. What yardage are my bow pins at? All right, you see right here, I have a black gold ascent sight. And this was originally a five pin. I've got it at a four pin. My top is 20, 30, 40, 50. And with the ascent sights, you can put your slider uh, yardages here, or you can loosen this up and start sliding that up and down. I always peg mine to the very top, lock it in, and I told you earlier that I'm not one of those 60, 70 yard bombers when it comes to hunting animals. So you'll see, I don't even have the slider tape on there because I know I'm not going to take those super long shots. Uh, but that's what I got them set at, 20, 30, 40, 50. And you can see the 20 and 30, they're not very far apart. Uh, but I've been using black gold sights since, I'm trying to remember, I think when Mike Ellig started the company in sometime in the, I don't even know when he started it, but <laughs> it's been so long I forgot how long I've been using black gold sights. Bomb proof, I beat them up, I drop them, I, uh, my bow really gets beat up and I've never had a problem yet with either the bow or the sight. What's the best place to spend money on optics? Binos, spotter, or scope? Uh, so this person's probably a rifle hunter. What's the best place to spend money on optics? Bino, spotter, or scope? Uh, for western hunting, I would say that if I, if I had only so much budget, I would probably spend the majority of my money on my rifle scope. Uh, and I know instantly some people are like, no, you got to have better binos. No, you got to have a better spotter. I agree. I buy the best you can afford. But if I'm going to have to allocate money to one versus the other, I'm going with the, the best rifle scope I can get. And it, you look at what you can get in the Leupold lineup, VX3i, VX5, VXX, and how well those perform based on what the price is, it's amazing. So I, I think you're going to get way better value in your rifle scope, way better utility. And I think the Koreans are coming. I hear a jet flying over. I never get a jet fly over my house. Get on TV, get a live gig going here, and all of a sudden I think North Korea is coming. Anyhow, some people don't see humor in my political commentary, so I apologize for that. Oh, before we get going too far, uh, we're, we got to talk about how you sign up for these notifications. You need to text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 313131. And if you're in Canada, 393939. And uh, some of you need to be watching your email because we picked the winners last week and you got notified uh, that you were a winner. So we gave away five Onyx Elite packages and we gave away a set of uh, carbon fiber trucking pools from Leupold. So be watching your email and you're going to be notified that, that you are the winner. So where were we before I, I got, so I, it's elk season. So I get into this stuff. I completely forget about all the business things I got to take care of when we're doing these. I'll get fired. All right. So I'm a Southeast whitetail hunter coming to Colorado for a fourth season cow hunt. What clothing layers should I prepare for? Southeast hunter southeast united states coming to colorado for a fourth season which is going to be somewhere probably november 12th or 14th to the 20th somewhere in that, those dates uh what clothing layers should you get uh for a cow elk hunt well the odds are at that time the cows are going to be lower than the bulls uh you're probably still going to have to be pretty active if this is a public land self-guided hunt 
you're still going to have to move around. You're still going to have to be doing some hiking. So when you ask the question of layers, that's the key to it. Start with a merino base layer. Start with a merino bottom uh, base layer, long johns as some people call them. Uh, then layer on top of that. For me, I use the Sitka Gear Timberline pant that time of year with a merino base layer bottom. That's all I put on the bottom. On the top, I start with a merino zip T top. And then I may, depending on what the temperatures are, I might just leave the truck with nothing but a vest over that. Sometimes if the weather's really crappy, it's snowing, it's raining, it's really cold, then I'll probably put another, uh, one of the other uh, layers of insulation on top of that with my Jetstream jacket on top of it. Just make sure you have a layering system that repels water, that allows for evaporation, and have a merino as your base next, the layer next to your skin as that base layer. How often do you, these are two questions, how often do you shoot your bow and how many arrows per day? How often do I shoot my bow and how many arrows per day? When these guys came over and set up all this camera gear, I was just finishing my last session of nine arrows. Uh, and sometimes, and my preference is I get up in the morning, I shoot five or six arrows. At lunch, I come over to my range here, I shoot five or six arrows. In the evening, I shoot six to 10 arrows. That's what I try to do. I don't sit there and just try to do 20 arrows at a time. You're fatiguing the muscles. It's hard, it really does not replicate what your shooting situation is. So I'm probably doing, I don't know, total in a day, 15, at the most 20 arrows in a day. Sometimes I only do eight or 10 and I try to, do them at different times during the day. I focus mostly on what is my first arrow. That's my, my greatest concern. Um, I know we've covered this before, but we've had three people ask what backpack you recommend. Okay, three people have asked, and we've covered it many times. I don't have it with me, it's out in my truck because I'm getting ready to head out elk hunting in the morning. I use Mystery Ranch uh, Metcalf is the backpacks that I use. I, they fold up, they compress very nicely as a day pack. And then if you need to make them a load hauler, they have a load shelf on them. You can put more weight in that thing than my body can carry. So I use the Mystery Ranch uh, Metcalf packs. I've been using them. Uh, I bought my first couple before I ever started this TV show uh, and all these other platforms. They just work really, really good for the type of elk hunting that I do. <coughs> Do you ever hunt solos solo these days, and if not, do you miss it? Do I ever hunt solo these days, and if not, do I miss it? I don't hunt solo these days. I've always got a camera guy with me because I'm gone so much. I tell my wife, look, if I'm hunting, I'm going to be filming. Uh, do I miss the days of solo hunting? Not really. Uh, occasionally, I'll sneak out for a day of deer hunting solo all by myself. If you go to our YouTube channel, oh, oh. Big news, big news, Amazon Prime. If you go to Amazon Prime, if you're a Prime person, uh, an Amazon subscriber, you can watch seasons five and season four of Fresh Tracks out on Amazon Prime. And I believe it was in season four, I filmed a deer hunt all by myself. I said, you know what? I'm just gonna go sit in my favorite little whitetail bottom, me and a camera, and I ended up shooting a whitetail, filming it, capturing it all, all by myself. And that was a really fun day. Uh, but I don't get to hunt solo that much anymore. But go to Amazon, uh, type in Leopold's Fresh Tracks, or, or even if you type in Randy Newberg, I've noticed that whew, we pop up and uh, enjoy it. We're going to start backfilling that with seasons three, two, and one of Fresh Tracks. Do you target practice with broadhead arrows or just field trips? I target practice with everything. Uh, you'll see here, I, I don't target practice with my grouse arrow. I'm going to step over here and grab my target arrows. You'll see there's a whole mix of, of what I practice with here. Broadheads and field points. These are grouse arrows. Uh, and I want to know where they're hitting. And I want to know every, you know every little deviation that might happen between my broadhead and my field point. So I use both because I want to know. And 
It's, <laughs> let's put it this way, the last place I want to find out that my broadhead is impacting at a different point than my field point is, is when I'm out there shooting at an animal. What's your thoughts on the 6.5 Creedmoor for elk and mule deer? 6.5 Creedmoor, I have one. Uh, I have a Howa Alpine Mountain Rifle and a 6.5 Creedmoor. If your shots are, are properly selected and your, your bullet location with a really high quality bullet like the Nosler Partition or E-tips or Acubons, a 6.5 Creedmoor will kill an elk. All things being equal, I would use it more for deer and antelope. It would not be my go-to elk rifle. Um, I know some people say, well, I can only get one rifle and I want it to be a Creedmoor. I would step up to a 7mm 08 uh, or a 308 rather than uh, just use a Creedmoor. A 7mm 08 or a 308 can be pressed into service to a larger animal more so than a 6.5 Creedmoor and when they drop down to a, a smaller animal you're not giving up hardly anything in uh, total trajectory your ballistic path so I, that's what I would do. Um, how do you figure out what size of diaphragm call will fit your mouth? Uh, trial and error. <laughs> the, uh, the question was, how do you know which size or style of diaphragm call will fit the shape of your mouth? I talked about that just a little bit ago. It becomes a bit of trial and error. Uh, for me, I, I've had to, it's taken me a lot of experimenting to figure it out. Now that I've found some that Rocky and the guys over at Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls make, I will never go to another call. It fits perfectly because I got this big yeah, people say, yeah, Newberg, we know you got a big mouth, but I've got a really flat top to the roof of my mouth. Do you shoot, uh, do you shoot grouse with broadheads or something else like judos? Uh, well, this is normally my grouse arrow. It's a judo. Uh, you can get small game tips. If you go out to our YouTube channel, Randy Newberg Hunter, you'll see uh, my elk hunting is kind of grouse hunting disrupted by a few bugles. And when I said I've got these arrows here, uh, these are veterans of a few grouse shots also. People say, well, who's dumb enough to ruin a $12, $15, $20 dollar broadhead for a grouse? Me. If somehow I forget my judo points, or I have lost judo points actually, I don't know how you lose one, but I have. Uh, I'll use a broadhead to shoot a grouse. The downside is they go right through the grouse and a lot of times you can't find the broadhead. So you're, you're a one and done a lot of times when you're shooting grouse with a broadhead. <laughs> this is elk talk live, but grouse is very relevant to elk hunting. So uh, again, I, I hope you're, you're appreciating the companies that bring this to us. Uh, Leupold, Botec, Onyx Map, uh, Tight Spot. In light of that, someone asked, what arrow rest do you use? Oh, what arrow rest do I use? I don't know if you'll be able to see it because it's dark in here, but right here I've got my ripcord ace. Um, right there, it's fall away rest. And when you draw back, it puts it in the upright position. When you release, it drops down. So ripcord is one of the companies that make this possible, along with black gold and all the others. Uh, I think I've been using Ripcord uh, Arrow Rest since that company started also. Uh, just, I like stuff that's durable, that works, that I don't have to worry about it breaking. And the, the Ripcords, the Black Golds, and the Tight Spots are made within 100 miles of my house. And I know the people who make them, and they are some serious archery hunters. I wish I was as good of an archery hunter as the folks who design and make and build all the stuff at Tight Spot, at Ripcord, uh, and at Black Gold. Those guys, they know what they're doing. And the products show that. My fear bow hunting elk is uh, bears. Do you carry a sidearm? My fear in bow hunting elk is bears. Do I carry a sidearm? Nope. I don't. And I hunt in grizzly country. I. You know, the odds of a bear coming after you are, you probably have a better chance of falling off a log and dying of, of hypothermia out there than you do of getting attacked by a bear. 
Uh, here in grizzly country, you just got to take precautions. I carry bear spray. Again, we did a whole video on our YouTube channel about why I use bear spray. And I know some people are going to say, oh, well, I use a firearm. Go talk to anybody who has been mauled by a grizzly bear. And they almost everybody will tell you the bear spray was way more effective or they had a sidearm, uh, a handgun, they weren't able to use it. All of a sudden you got a bear, he's got a hold of your shooting arm, he's breaking your arm, tearing you apart. Good luck trying to shoot that bear with that. Or he displaces the firearm when he hits you or somehow you get separated from the firearm. Usually with bear spray, you can get that out and spray that bear while they're on top of you way better than you can with a firearm. So that's, I, I understand some people are concerned about that. I wouldn't let it bother me. I'd just be smart about it and I would carry bear spray. Would you build a fire if it's cold while spotting to stay warm? Would I build a fire if it's cold while I'm spotting in order to stay warm? Yep, we do it all the time. If you watch some of our late season elk hunts, I would say if it's cold, every day we start a little fire. Uh, gives you something to do, keeps your mind off things, allows you to stay there and be glassing. Uh, if you have a partner, especially one guy can stay by the fire and warm up, the other guy running the spotting scopes and glassing. Then you rotate and you keep doing that. Sometimes you can put a little fire right next to where you're glassing. It allows you to stay out there all day. And that is the key. When, when you're hunting late season, these cold weather periods, it is a glassing game. The more time you can spend behind your optics, the greater the likelihood you're going to see an elk and you're going to shoot it. Will a lost calf call bring in bulls or cow calls only? Will a lost calf call bring in bulls or will only cow calls do that? Um, you know, I don't really use lost calf calls. Uh, I'm sure it might, uh, but I wouldn't be that worked up about it. I'd probably just cow call if that's your preference. Uh, I, I prefer bugling. But I, I'm sure it would probably work. I just don't use it. The grouse population here in Oregon are really high this year. Have you seen the same over there? The grouse population in Oregon is really high this year. Have I seen the same in Montana? No, I didn't see any grouse today, which is unusual to go elk hunting and not see any grouse. So uh, when I was out bear hunting this spring, I saw all kinds of grouse. So I think they're probably doing okay. I just uh, unfortunately, my calendar is we went to Nevada for archery deer, went to New Mexico for antelope, went back to Nevada for pronghorn. I had to go to Minnesota for my mother's 70th birthday. Happy birthday, Mom. And I just got back the other day. So, unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of time to be out chasing grouse and elk here in Montana. What's your best tip for wet weather elk hunting? My best what for wet weather? Best, best tip. For what is my best hunting. tip for wet weather elk hunting? Hmm. I don't know if the person is asking archery or rifle. It doesn't say. Doesn't maybe say. like equipment or... Okay. Like I don't know that I really have a tip. Uh, I go out and hunt the same as I do all the other time. Uh, I just make sure I've got the proper clothing to stay warm and stay dry and stay comfortable because if I'm uncomfortable, mentally I'm going to be checked out even if I'm still there. And if I am uncomfortable, I'm probably going to talk myself into, oh, I should just go back to camp. So for me, it's mostly about the clothing would be my tip for wet weather elk hunting. How are we doing, Marcus? We are at 43 minutes, 44 minutes. 44 minutes and we're getting a flashing light there. That's never a good sign. <laughs> Whenever you are in the TV world and you have a flashing light, that usually means bad things are about to happen. So, what else we got? Do you ever do any still hunting through dark timber? Do I ever do any still hunting through dark timber? People have asked that quite a few times. No, I don't. Uh, it's, it will work. I used to do it a lot. But I have found that the periods of time when you're still hunting, usually our rifle seasons, usually are going to be post rut or late season. And I have way, way more success getting to a good glassing point, knowing where the sanctuaries are and glassing those sanctuaries all day. 
rather than still hunting through dark, dark timber. The densities of elk in dark, dark timber in most places is very low. Uh, do you prefer to walk ridges and bugle down into timber pockets to locate bulls or get into the timber pockets uh, before you bugle? Do I prefer to walk the ridge and bugle to elk down below or go into the timber pockets and bugle from there? I would have to say I'm a ridge guy. Uh, I like to get up. I know the sound will carry better. If I hear something, it's easier to locate it. And then I'm usually not right in there with them. And I can say, all right, what's my wind doing? And adjust my approach based on what the wind tells me. So, all right. uh, 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 we got time for one or two more questions. But next week, I don't know that we're going to be able to go, uh, go live on this. And the reason being is we are going to be so far back in the sticks in Wyoming we, we have no form of any type of coverage. So uh, if we miss next week, the 20th, uh, grant me a little pardon, we will be packing elk out that day. And we'll tell you about it as quick as we get back to a connection. But what do we got, Marcus? All right. Randy, love the shows. I'm sitting here with my 10-year-old boy watching the stream, and it's his first year of hunting elk in Colorado, or in Idaho. Do you have any advice for him? Uh, person is sitting with their 10 year old watching the live stream. It's uh, his son's first year of, uh, I'm assuming it's going to be rifle hunting in Idaho. Any advice? Have fun. That's my number one piece of advice. Have fun. If you're having fun, you're going to be enthusiastic, you're going to be confident, and the odds are you're going to find elk. It's just, it, it, that's what we do this for. We do it because it's fun, we do it to get some food, we do it to connect with the natural world. Make sure you're having fun. That's my number one tip. A 10 year old is not, they can't walk 10 miles a day like we can. They can't carry a 40 pound pack all day. Make sure it is fun for them. And then when they get older and bigger, you're gonna have a, an elk hunting partner for life. Do you use game cameras? Do I use game cameras? No, I don't. Uh, reason being is that they're illegal in Montana. Uh, you cannot have a game camera out during any open season, so I've just learned to do my hunting, my scouting, everything else without game cameras. And I know some people really like them, and, and I get it. Uh, I think it'd be cool if you could go and check your cameras, uh, get the card back. Maybe you and your family are looking, wow, look what showed up here. Uh, but I have hunted areas, really arid spots in Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada where you walk up to a water source and there's 20 game cameras hanging there. And uh, I look at that and I'm like, nah, I don't like this. But hey, each state's gonna have their own rules and that's fine. Whatever those hunters in that state want, that's what it should be. Not what Montana likes or not what someone else likes. But to answer the question, I don't have any game cameras. Last one, Marcus. What factors determine whether you would use an Acubond or a partition bullet? What factors determine whether I would use an Acubond bullet or a, a partition bullet? Uh, first of all, it's going to be what my rifle prefers. They're both excellent bullets, controlled expansion, good penetration. I have some rifles where they're just slightly more finicky about wanting partition or wanting Acubond or whatever. Uh, I, I view them almost interchangeably. Uh, the partition maybe has a little bit uh, more reputation for its mushrooming and controlled expansion. Uh, I'd, I'd have a hard time choosing one over the other for any reason other than what does my rifle prefer. So, With that, folks, thanks for watching. Thanks to all of the great sponsors, Bowtech, Leupold, Onyx, Ripcord, Black Gold, and Tight Spot. And uh, I hope that you are out elk hunting right now. It is prime time. It, it is the peak of the rut. We, we spend the whole year getting ready for hunting season, scouting, staying in shape, practicing for what is happening from today. Maybe it depends on if you're a rifle hunter through the end of November. Go out and do it. Make sure you have fun. And most of all, be safe and enjoy. Smile. Big smile and we'll see you in a week or so. Thanks for watching. Smile. I don't have any problem smiling. I was born smiling. This year we're having fun.
all right camera guy says this year's